Good morning, Riverbend Church. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a great personal greeting by Craig there. Um, great to see you all. We've got a jam-packed, Christ-centered service for you today. So I hope you are excited uh, to participate in that and worship. Uh, I will be brief. Just want to welcome you. And I want to read one verse. Our, our BFG has been going through the book of Galatians. And just wanted to share this one verse with you. If you are a believer in this room, this verse is true for you. It says this in Galatians 2:20. This is Paul speaking. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. That alone gives us plenty of reason to worship. Amen? Amen. Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for saving us. We desperately needed saving. And we did not deserve it. But you came. You rescued us. You saved us from our sins. We are forever indebted to you. It is a debt of thanksgiving we could never repay. So we are thankful we get to spend all eternity doing it. To thank you to sing your praises. And I pray that this morning we would get a little glimpse of glory as we get to sing your praises with the saints. Please bless the service, bless the preaching of your word. May it go forth with clarity and boldness. And Lord, bless us. Keep our minds free from distractions. Help us to worship unhindered. And to be further sanctified, even in this service, we pray. Amen. Amen, church. It is good to be with you this morning. Why don't you stand on your feet and let's enjoy the Lord together. Church, 
day and we won't be quiet oh, we shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the lord our god is surely in this place and we won't be quiet we shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the lord there's joy in the house of the lord today and we won't be quiet we shout out
you thankful this morning, church, for the everlasting love of Christ on our lives. Amen.
this chorus for it. And I will wait for you. I will wait for you on your word. I will rely. I will wait for you. Surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied. Amen. Well, good morning, church family. It's great to see you today. Isn't it great to join together in the affirmation of truths about our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ? Amen? Amen. Well, I have the opportunity to lead us in the reading of God's Word this morning. And our text today comes from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 11. Now, I make known to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received, in which you also stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold firmly to the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I handed down to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. This is the word of God. You may be seated. We're entering into our time of giving this morning, and there are a few different ways that you can be faithful to give this morning. We want to be mindful to be faithful in our giving. Consider, consider the Lord who has given us so much, and even in this text, consider the gospel through which he has reached us to bring us to faith in him, that we would be right before him, justified because of the penalty paid through the Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Amen? Well, let's be faithful in our giving this morning. Join with him in what he is doing. And if you will, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for yet another occasion where we get to come together as a body. Be reminded of what you are actively doing, Lord. You are working out your plan of redemption, Lord, because of your gospel, because of your son, Jesus Christ, and the provision made for us, both in living without sin, perfectly obeying your law, which qualified our Savior to go to the cross and to die for us. Lord, that we might be redeemed and restored as image bearers under who you are. To your glory, Lord. Lord, help us through these givings. Uh, let it be used, Lord, to the furtherance of your gospel and of your kingdom work, Lord. Help us to join you in what you are actively doing in this church and amongst this body. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church Rachel is about to lead us in a song, um, and just before she does, <clears throat> there have been many times um, in ministry, in the life of being with people that you've seen just heartache, hurt, um, and this song that she's about to sing, I'll never forget the first time I really heard it, and it was for a friend of ours, um, some of you may know, her name is Meredith, used to go here, and um, she walked down the aisle to this song. The song is called, He's Always Been Faithful. And who would have known many years later that God would have taken her husband home as she's left with five boys um, here on this earth. And yet she still claims, if you know her, he's always been faithful. And many of you have your own stories, um, but this truth still remains, right? He's always been faithful. Um, this song is over 20 years old, but yet the message does not change. 
So uh, Rachel's going to bless us with this song and just, just soak in the lyrics of this. And just remind of the testimony in your life. beautiful truth. He certainly is always faithful to us, isn't he? We praise the Lord personally, each one of us, and as a church as well. Well, we're glad you're here. If you're a visitor today, we're really glad you're here. Thank you for coming out and being with us today. We pray the Lord motivated you to be here, and we hope that you'll enjoy and worship with us, be challenged and encouraged as we preach God's word today. Right after our service out these doors over here, there's a welcome center. We'd love to meet you, have a gift for you, and just want to get to know you. Some of our pastors and greeters will be there Please stop by. Just a few announcements. This is really the start of a very special week for Christians. And as we were praying as elders this morning, many of the men said, wow, this, this is a truth we teach year-round. But, but it's exciting to focus on Passion Week, the resurrection week of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. So we have many events going on this week. In fact, Wednesday, I'll take a little hiatus from my numbers series, and I'm going to pick a particular passage 
during this week where the Lord taught and what he was going through on Wednesday night. And then, of course, on Friday night, we're going to have our Good Friday service that starts at 6.30. Be right here inside here. Uh, an hour-long service of singing, preaching, singing, preaching, uh, sor- little sermonettes as we look at the life of Christ as he's making his way to the cross. Uh, sobering because our Lord dies for us. And yet, <laughs> that's the gospel. It's what we believe in. So uh, we look forward to that. And then Sunday morning, we will have um, a sunrise service right out on our field out here in front. Bring a lawn chair. Bring a blanket, maybe. Depends on the weather. Um, at 630, we're going to have a great service singing. We have a phenomenal testimony that's coming that we want you to share with you. And then Pastor Bobby's going to preach that morning. Uh, we're going to look forward to that at 630 uh, in the morning. And then at 1030, our regular service, Easter service, choirs and special numbers and preaching. We're just going to have a great time at 1030. So make sure you're involved in all of those. We have these cards. They're out at all of the points of entry or points of exit. If you're going out, grab a stack of these. Give them to your neighbor. You can just say, hey, I would love, love to take you to this or have you come. So many people will come. So please uh, be a part of inviting someone. This is just a great tool. You might get to share the gospel with them. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Second, the Riverbend Academy is getting ready for their uh, drama production. Uh, Riverbend's had a long history of putting on good dramas. And so the one's coming up, Aladdin Jr. It's April 21st, 22nd. Buy tickets. Uh, we look forward to that. It's coming soon. Uh, We announced this last week. We have a women's ministry luncheon in two weeks from today, uh, right afterwards. It's an an invitation to all of our ladies, members or non-members. We are here uh, to invite you to go through those doors in two weeks and be a part of that. There we're going to share many of our women's ministries and some new things that are happening that we're very excited about, particularly for our ladies. So please mark that on your calendar. Stay. It'll be an hour long. And uh, then... um, We'll get you back with uh, your families and so forth. Uh, one, one other plea here, too. We need some children's helpers on Sunday mornings and Wednesdays just to assist teachers. One, once a month, just to assist teachers. So uh, remember that. And the kitchen ministry also needs some help. If you want to work on that, that's a great Wednesday night ministry. Uh, we're so grateful for Gabriel and his crew. Uh, please see him as well. Now, I have one more very, very special announcement. I've been... Looking forward to this for many weeks. And uh, God has been doing some wonderful things. And he has been uh, reforming and revitalizing the leadership and the direction of our seminary and our Bible college. And it's a great pleasure to introduce some things to you. So first I want to start with inviting up uh, our board, our newly formed board of the seminary and Bible college. Would you men come up? And our elders as well as Riverbend uh, Church. Uh, So elders and, and Bible college board, would you please come up? And second, uh, I count it a great privilege uh, to introduce to you our new academic dean, Chris Johnson. Chris is going to share with you just in a moment some just things that God has laid on his heart and some exciting things that are coming uh, Chris has uh, just been a great blessing to get to know. I've had him in my classes at the seminary. He's a graduate, of course, but he has been married to his dear bride, Stephanie, for 20 years now. They have three children, Noah, Levi, and Eden. Uh, he has been, for since 2020, the associate pastor at Crosswalk Church with our dear friend, Mitch Pridgen, who is preaching, or he would be here. He is on the board as well. Um, he served Cornerstone Radio, and many of you know his voice from that. For 17 and a half years, we've heard his voice on the radio here locally, speaking truth and, and ministering to us. He currently um, is teaching at Riverbend Academy. Uh, he's well-educated. He has his associates through Liberty University. He has his B.A. through Master's University, and he has his own Master's of Divinity through our seminary, CTS, here, and we're excited to have him. Chris, would you come share a few words with us? I'd love to. Thank you. Well, thank you, Pastor Scott, and thank you very much. Brothers and sisters, I can't tell you what a privilege it is to stand before you this morning, and the honor it is to just share with you some thoughts. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. This scripture has been so special to me and my family, and I can testify that it has been both a light and a lamp to our feet and to our path uh, these many years, and going back to even my youngest memories. 
I can testify to the Lord's kindness and his providence in directing our steps even to this very place today. And so it's with great joy that I just humble myself before you and ask for your prayers in this next endeavor. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to serve as the academic dean of Christ Bible College and Theological Seminary. And I can tell you this, as a member of the first graduating class of CTS, it really is a wonderful opportunity, a marvelous opportunity truly for students both in our college and our seminary to be trained and to be equipped to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with greater understanding, with greater passion, but also with greater conviction. Our commitment is to provide a Christ-centered education that is the highest of qualities. And so we labor as unto the one who went to the cross for us. We labor for the one who is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's our joy to serve him in his command to make the gospel known in both the Great Commission and also to evangelize the lost and to disciple the saved. And so my prayer is that God would glorify himself as he strengthens us for the task ahead. As he opens doors for us to be able to reach young men, young women, middle-aged men, middle-aged women, old men, old women, anyone who would desire to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because it is by God's kind providence, his sovereign grace really, and your prayers, many of you here, your support, that the Lord has done great things. I want to tell you about some of those things even as we start this morning, that in God's kindness we have been able to confer master's degrees on seven graduates. And in seven weeks from this very day we will gather again to confer two more master's degrees on additional graduates. And we praise God for that. What a wonderful, kind gift to know that these men, these women have been educated, have been, have been encouraged, and that they are growing in their ability not only to love the Lord more, but to be useful to his service. But we're also praying for additional students. We're also praying that God would open the door for many more. And as we move into the second year of our Bible college, I'm thrilled for what is ahead. I'm so thankful for the students, for the faculty, those who have served over these last uh, year here at the Bible College, who persevered through the newness of a first year. But our mission remains the same, and that is to glorify God by providing that Christ-centered education. And I can tell you this, I'm committed to making sure that our institution, it maintains the highest level of integrity and also of standards, but at the same time, it provides a unique opportunity for men and women of all walks of life to come and to succeed. And so that's our desire. How can we help these people succeed? And it's our prayer that God would raise up mighty men, mighty women, that they would be equipped with the knowledge of Christ, with the wisdom and skill that comes from the word of God to serve him, that they be hungry to serve and they will be fruitful in their serving. And so as I consider these things, just to share three things with you, that really resounded in my own heart as we think to equip and to train and to disciple. The first is that this would be an accessible ministry. The second, that it would be an achievable goal, but also that it be sustainable. And I'm convinced that there is, these three components are vital for this to be a successful venture. Because I want you to know that I'm committed to doing everything we can to make our class accessible to anyone who desires to learn from any perspective. If they want to learn, we want to make that happen. And so as we provide evening classes, we open the doors for working men and women to come and to learn, to grow, to even to achieve a dream that maybe they thought was impossible in an associate's or a bachelor's or even a master's degree. But second, to craft the classroom experience in such a way that the student can gladly say this is achievable, that they can determine and say with joy that this is something that I can do because they know that we value every minute of their time. That we value the, the, the fact that they are stepping away from other responsibilities to, to do this. And that we will help them to manage that schedule well. And our third commitment is sustainability. It's not just in a week or two weeks or a month that you earn a degree. It's over time. And so we recognize that no matter the degree plan, each student needs to have the confidence that they can start and finish the program because the educational opportunity afforded them is maintainable and sustainable. So it's these three things, accessible, achievable, and sustainable that is our goal as we move forward into the future. 
Beyond that, it's our desire that they be faithful in their homes, that they will be faithful in their local churches. We long to see faithful husbands and fathers, wives and mothers, sons and daughters, but also that they would understand the need to be planted in their local church and be useful to the Lord in that ministry, to take what they are learning and put it right back into practice, that they'd be fruitful even in those educational years. But in order for this to happen, we have to strive to offer an educational opportunity that is designed to inspire them to confidently choose Christ Bible College and Theological Seminary so that they might know that we are working so that they might succeed. And a final thing to tell you is that we're thrilled for the opportunity to launch new programs, online program opportunities for those who might not be in our area, but especially those who are pastors and church leaders and missionaries around the world. So as you think about this, as you hear the mission and the goals of Christ Bible College and Theological Seminary, I hope you will pray for this. And I personally want to express my heartfelt gratitude, my thankfulness to the elders of Riverbend Community Church for their overwhelming support, for their prayers, for their encouragement as we begin the process and we press on into the future together. I would also praise the Lord for the support from my fellow elders at Crosswalk Church, their prayers, their counsel, their encouragement to step ahead in this, to partner together here, multiple churches working together to make this a reality. And finally, I want to speak to you if you're here this morning, to ask you, really to beg you to pray for us. I would ask you to pray that the Lord would give us his wisdom and his guidance. The Bible says that the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, and I am persuaded that he will answer the prayers that you pray because the Bible tells us in James 1.5 that he loves to do that. He loves to provide wisdom. So I ask that you'd pray. I'd ask that you'd support. I ask that you spread the news. I ask that you would help us to make this known. A closing passage, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much. In just a minute, we're going to lay hands on Chris as a board here and ask God to bless his ministry and his oversight of the schools. I just wanted to mention the board. God has brought together a unique group of men there, uh, men of all walk of life. There's retired pastors that have served the Lord many, many years, served the church. Uh, there's some of our own elders on it. There's laymen on it. There's men from PhDs to whatever else. It's, it's a unique group of men. We look for men who desire to be a part of this and understand the direction of the school and God has raised those men up and I am very proud to serve with them. There's a couple of them not here because they're pastors of other churches in our area and that's our goal to be a part and join with other churches and uh, allow this ministry to help encourage their church uh, to do those things and so God is helping us reach across the many lines to to help us be a church that is successful for his glory in this area. Well, now I've asked uh, Pastor Jason uh, Carr and our retired pastor and dear friend, uh, Dwight Brown, to pray for uh, Chris as we lay hands on him. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're very grateful for the many ways you have worked over these past several years through uh, Christ Theological Seminary and now this past year, Christ Bible College. We're very grateful for Chris Johnson uh, for this start of a, of a new, new chapter. Lord, bringing him to us to be a dean. Lord, we're very, very blessed. And we, we pray for the future. Lord, that that many would be equipped, that you'd bring many to the college, to the seminary, to be equipped as pastors, and missionaries, and counselors, and teachers, ministry leaders. Father, that uh, through, through this ministry, through them, many would be edified in, in Christ 
in many, many churches throughout our area and throughout the world. And through it all, everything we do, we, we pray uh, that Christ would be exalted. Father, as, as Chris just read, please glorify yourself through these schools, exceeding abundantly beyond all we could ask or think. Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful for what you have done to bring this seminary and Bible college into being. We thank you for the knowledge that all scripture is God-breathed and it is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness so that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished, equipped for every good work. What a privilege it is to have your word, to be teaching it to young men who have been called into ministry, to equip them for the task that is ahead. Lord, we pray for Chris. We thank you for him. I so much remember the three courses that I was privileged to teach here. Him being in it and reading his papers and seeing his heart in class. And I thank you that you have ordained this day that he might take this role. Bless him, use him mightily for your honor and for your glory. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you all for being part of that. We are truly excited about that. And um, many prayers, many meetings have taken place over the last few months as we've been preparing for this. And so we are ex extremely excited for what God is doing. Please continue to pray for us. Take your Bibles, and we will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but I want to start in John chapter 12. So turn to John chapter 12, starting in verse 12, as we look at what is often referred to as the triumphal entry of Christ, but really, in a sense, it is his death march, isn't it? He is now in town and headed to the cross. John chapter 12, verse 12 through 19 reads this way. On the next day, a large crowd who had come to the feast, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. And they began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Well, now Jesus is embracing this king role. You remember back in John chapter 16 that he was trying to be pushed into that role. They were wanting him to take that kingly position and crush Rome, bring in his kingdom, and let them rule and reign with them. But Jesus would not do it. It was not his hour. It was not his time. Jesus knew what awaited him was death and resurrection first. But as he comes into town, all this is being orchestrated by God. They are quoting these crowds. Notice in 12 and 13, particularly 13, they're quoting Psalms 118. They're quoting verse 25 and 26. This is an anticipation of the Messiah. The Jews knew and believed wholeheartedly in the coming of the Messiah. And this was the real one. But he was coming as a savior before he was coming as a king. And this is where so many of them stumbled and so many still today stumble. But notice he is hailed as the long-awaited one. Now this was an absolute nightmare for the Pharisees, right? This is the last thing they wanted. They had been planning his death. On his way to Jerusalem, two blind men were sitting along the road and they hailed the Lord Jesus Christ as the son of David. A term used for the messianic coming of Christ. And the question is, will Jesus embrace this acclamation? Will he embrace this kingship? Look at verses 14 through 16. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as is written, Fear not, daughters of Zion. Behold, your king is coming. Seated on the donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at first. Now here's what I'm after. But when Jesus was glorified, we're going to tie that in to 1 Corinthians, then they remembered these things and were written of him and that they had done these things to him. Well, here we find our Lord not walking away from the praise of his kingly position. 
He's recognizing it. He's allowing it to take place. He is the king of Israel. And he is choosing to fulfill that prophecy long ago given in Zechariah that, that he is speaking of here. Zechariah 9, nine. Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout triumphantly, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming. He is just. He is endowed with salvation. Humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. There he is. He is fulfilling one of the great messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. And so he is saying with his action, I am the king of Israel, I am the Messiah, and he is doing it at the most dangerous moment. Hatred is building. Plans are being uh, worked out so that they can put him to death. Notice in chapter 11, verse 53, just up from there, so that from that day on, they, that's the the religious elite, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sanhedrin, planned together to kill him. That's what their plan was, to kill him. And yet Jesus is doing all of this. Now, notice how John weaves this story together to make plain that the kingship of Jesus was more than just something local. He is talking about a worldwide kingship here. Look with me at verse 17 and through 19. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify about him. For this reason also the people went and met him because they had heard he had performed this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, I love the saying here, you see that you are not doing any good. That you can just, they're, they're mad at each other, right? The world has gone after him. That's a statement of the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. The world has gone after the Lord Jesus Christ. And though there is a huge emotional charged crowd that's following Jesus in the wake of Lazarus uh, rising from the dead, the goal is that the world is going to come after him. He has to die. There's no way the world can get to him. There's no way the world can have eternity. He has to die. And he has his heart and mind set on that cross. And he is making his way to them. Very interesting in chapter 11, just if you flip back to verse 48, they're very upset. They're conspiring to kill Jesus. One of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, remember he'll have, he'll have Jesus in his own home uh, and there uh, persecuting Jesus just in a little bit from this during the middle of this week, later in this week. Caiaphas, the high priest that year, said, you do not know what you're doing at all. They're, they're, they're frustrated. But he makes some profound statements here that he doesn't understand. Nor do you take into account that this expedient uh, for you and that one man must die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. What a statement. Now, he did not say this on his own initiative, but being the high priest this year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not only, and here's the verse I'm after, not only for the nation, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. This is the goal of the Lord Jesus Christ, to gather in the entire people of God, and he is doing that. To further, <laughs> to further understand that, look at verse 20, back in our text, 12, 20 through 26. All of a sudden, now, to see that this prophecy was true, that the whole world starts going after him, look at verse 20. Now there were some Greeks. Oh, wasn't this a Jewish thing? The Greeks have showed up, right? Among those who were going, out to wor going up to worship the feast. And they came to Philip, who was up a state of Galilee, and began asking him, Sir, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew and Ellen, and Philip came and told Jesus, and Jesus answered and said to them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This is it. It wasn't in John 6. It wasn't any other time. This is it. This is where I'm going to be glorified. When they, and maybe they're thinking, well, right now he's going to take his kingship. His glory is tied to his death, burial, and resurrection. That's where his glory is tied to, and he's trying to communicate to deaf ears in this. Verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. That's what Jesus is going to do, and I'm looking at his harvest right in front of me. Isn't that beautiful? 
He died so that we would be the first fruits of his resurrection, his death, burial, and resurrection. This was his goal from the beginning. Notice verse 25. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it into a life of eternity. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servants will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So a complete different approach to the kingdom of God. It's coming through death. It's coming through burial. It's coming through resurrection and the exaltation and glorification of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the whole world, these, these Pharisees were right. Look, the whole world is going after him. Really? Oh, well, yeah. And that's what's happened here at this Jewish festival that was, was goals were, were the coming of the Passover and the bringing in of the harvest. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ who explains he is the fruit of the harvest. But let's not forget that there was joy and praise here. I, I love this triumphal entry. They were oblivious to what was going to happen. Even his disciples did not understand what was going to happen in the next few days. There's tremendous joy there. And yet, here is our Lord who has joy in the fact that he knows in just a matter of days he's going to hang on a cross, be put in a cold grave, and raise again. Do you remember the joy set before him? Remember despising the shame? We've been talking about that the last few weeks. He was ready to do this. And God gave him great joy in this day, showed great joy towards this kingly interest, uh, entrance that was fit for royalty here. But his goal is death and resurrection. That's the goal. The Passover interest was the selection of the Passover lamb. It would have been on the same day, the day they selected the lamb that they were going to sacrifice for their family, the day they would keep, keep that lamb and bring it into their home for several days and there tend it and care for it. This was all the fulfillment of the Old Testament. This is Exodus chapter 12 where they selected the lamb and painted its blood on the doorpost and the death angel passed over them. This is the final lamb and this joyful Hebrew family that would have been in town, they would have been selecting their lamb at the same time. But in amongst them, unknowing to them, was the final lamb. <laughs> ah, the last lamb, the last blood. He was right in their presence, and they were worshiping him and joyfully celebrating him, and yet they did not understand that he'd come to die. John the Baptist knew it. He said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist knew that he was come to die. He was come to be greater than anything in his ministry. But this lamb would rise again. We love that about this time, uh, this season of, of, the, of the advent of the resurrection of Christ. This lamb will rise again. He'll prove our sins are forgiven. And that is the central theme of the gospel. We can't just stop at the death. His resurrection is the key to all we have. And so that's where 1 Corinthians 15 comes in. And as you make your way over there, I want you to remind you that there's been a theme here. They have, they have blundered what public worship looks like. They have made a mockery of, of the church's true worship of the Lord Jesus Christ and how it has been done. And so here Paul is now taking them back to 1 Corinthians. He wants to use the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as a as a, the main emphasis for worship. And though they had lost their way in chapter 12 through 14, his goal is crystal clear. He wants to describe what the gospel looks like. He wants to people to see the result of the gospel and that not only Christ is resurrected bodily from the dead, so are all believers. And this is what he is after. Now, doubtlessly, there was false teachers who had sought to convince uh, the Corinth church, that there, there was no bodily resurrection that was moving through the church. And it was an attack. It was an attack on the gospel. And so when you get to chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Paul is going to set that straight. And he's going to prove that the power of the gospel, the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, takes death and makes new life. That's what he does. And he's going to illustrate it in his own self. Jesus Christ is going to die like that That grain that went into the ground and then died and then bore much fruit. Now, all believers throughout history will be given glorified bodies. And I love some of the examples. Um, when the uh, disciples, the 
inner circle, the leaders among leaders, Peter, James, and John are with Christ in Matthew 18, and they're on the Mount of Transfiguration. There, Elijah and Moses show up. Uh, they're not a bunch of sparklies just floating around, and somehow they have a name tag hanging on them. They recognize them. They know who they are. That's Elijah and Moses, and Lord, let us build, let us build booths, let us worship. They're motivated by that. You, gotta, you have to understand there's all kinds of those who were against the resurrection in the first century. The Sadducees had taught for centuries that was, there was no resurrection. The Gnostic Greece, uh, Greeks were on the rise, and they teach that, that spirit is good, but matter and flesh and body is bad. So after death, there's no material body. You'll just float around in the spirit world. That's basically what they taught. There's really nothing to the resurrection except the sparklies, right? Then you come along with the mystic world that was growing in the east. And they taught that somehow you would return to somebody else's body. And you try to get things right until you got it right and eventually make your way free of this world, but not in a physical body. And so Paul is set to prove that the gospel is clear it, and clearly teaches what eternal life looks like. That's what this chapter is about. It's life physically with our resurrected Savior. And the Corinth church needed to realize that those who are in Christ will live forever and not in some disembodied spirit that was being taught. So Paul was going to set this record straight. There's a glorious resurrection. We have glorious bodies like our Lord. Jesus himself said in John 14, 19, after a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live and you will live also. That's a statement from our Lord. You're going to live. And then Paul picks up on this in one of my favorite texts to teach me and remind me what life after this life here on earth looks like is found in Philippians 3, 20 through 21. Listen to this. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior. Right? Do you wait for the Savior or are you just kind of, wow, I just can't wait to get rid of this world? No, no. Citizens of heaven eagerly wait for Jesus. They got to get that right because a lot of people just want to get rid of this world, the pain and suffering, it's all here. If that's where you're at, that you're missing what heaven's about. Citizens of heaven eagerly wait for Jesus, for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to what he's going to do. Who will transform the body of our humble estate in conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Isn't that amazing? So our dear sister Jo, who just passed away a little over a week ago, she is given a body. And all of us will be given bodies, resurrected bodies, to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Christ's resurrection is a guarantee of our resurrection. I'm going to say that over and over throughout the rest of 1 Corinthians. You have to understand that. God raised him, he'll raise his children. He promises. And he'll give us a body and we will be the first fruits of the resurrection. It's clear his body was physical when we even look at Jesus because he's the model, right? So we're going to be like him. When we see him, we'll be like him. First John chapter 3, verse 2. So he had a physical body. And, and he employs Thomas, remember? Thomas, stick your finger in my hand. Thrust, thrust your hand is the Greek word, into my side. He's there. They see him. They touch him. He's Ask for something to eat. I particularly like that after the resurrection. I'm looking forward to the feast of the marriage of the Lamb, right? He asked for something to eat. And, 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 and as we see, and we'll see just in a few moments, he's witnessed by so many. They physically walk and talk with the Lord Jesus. So our glorified Lord speaks and he ministers and he socializes with the believers here on earth. And so the Apostle Paul in order to return this wayward church. Remember, this, this church has lost its way. His goal is to bring them back to worship, and he's going to use the doctrine of the resurrection to do it. That's why this chapter is so glorious, and I've been trying to time it to hit this Easter a week, and I'm so glad the Lord has helped me do that. And so here as we look in the Corinth church, this letter to Corinth, you're going to get a glorious glimpse of the future as we go through this. You're going to see how glorious our Lord is and what life he has for us. And so we should care deeply about these things. 
So this morning, I'm going to try my hardest. We'll end when we have to, and I'll pick up next week. But we're going to look at four evidences of the resurrection. Now, the first evidence of the resurrection is saving faith. Look at verses 1 and 2 that Aaron read for us today. Now, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, I love this first statement. Now I make known to you, brethren. It's an emphatic declaration. Everything about the Greek structure is emphatic, right? Paul is coming out. He's just finished his 12 through 14 and trying to deal with their very foreign, pagan-influenced worship. And he says, I'm going to declare to you now what has been made known. I'm going to make this known to you. He's calling us and he's calling the attention of the church in the first century to full attention. And what's he calling it to? Notice he's calling it to the gospel, isn't he? I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. That's what he makes known. He doesn't make known his great ministry and all the things that's happened. He doesn't make known to whatever everybody else thinks. He wants to bring them to the gospel. Isn't that our job? You can have a lot of empty conversations. There's one that isn't empty. It's the gospel. And when you have gospel conversations, it is the good news. That's the word here. Ulangelion is the, the Greek word. And, and the structure is amazing here, which I preach to you. And literally, the Greek says this. I, I gospelize you, in a sense, is the idea of the tense there. When I ulangelioned you. I gospeled you when I gave you and, and, and personally gave you and delivered to you the gospel. My goal was to gospelize you. Have you completely convinced in the work, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ? So I think Paul is saying this. And when he came, he preached the gospel to them. They received the gospel. They stood in the gospel. And they are saved by the gospel. Notice that throughout that. This is, this is what they received. Chapter 1. Just flip back real quickly. Verse 18. Chapter 1, verse 18. The word of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing. Right? Where's the rest of the forty or 50,000 people of Ormond Beach? I, I trust some of them are in some other good churches, but because the cross is foolish, and you say, well, they probably wouldn't say it's foolish. Well, it's not enough to give a day. See, most of the world looks at the cross as foolish, the suffering of Christ, the finished work of Jesus, but not to save. Notice, but to us, I love that. That's circled in my Bible. I'm looking right at it. To us, who are being saved, it is the power of God. And we see that term, salvation, uh, used in the past, present, and future. There's a continually aspect of God's saving grace in our life. If you drop down to verse 22, for indeed the Jews ask for signs and the Greeks search for wisdom. Notice that both of those groups are not looking for the gospel. Both of those groups, and they, those, those terms filter into all kinds of religious things within our society today. They're looking for signs and they're looking for wisdom. They're not looking for the gospel. That's, the way, that's what sets us apart, right? And praise God that he has done this, verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified. And because they're not looking for the gospel, it's a stumbling block to the Jews and it's foolishness to the Gentiles. You see that? That's what happens. Chapter 2, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superior speech, verse 1, or wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimonies of God. And I, this is, if you've ever been in my office, this is on my office, this is my life verse. For I have determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. There was nothing else that he wanted. He wanted Christ proclaimed, even in his weakness. And notice in verse 5, so your faith won't rest on the works of men. And if you think you got yourself to God on your own, you're resting your faith on yourself. See, true conversion is that we rest our faith on Christ alone. Lord, I got nothing but an empty hand. I got nothing. I'm drowning. I'm going to die. There's no hope for me. I put my faith, my God-given faith in you. So Paul is reminding the church as you work your way back to 1 Corinthians 15 that he was the one that God used to bring the gospel to these dead souls in Corinth and give them new life. God did that through the gospel. Notice he says the word received in that first couple of verses there, which you also received. Uh, this means that there was a, a time, there's it's an error's tense, there was a time in the past when God gave you this gift of the gospel. 
You've forgotten that God gifted with you. Do you not do that every once in a while? Our lives maybe reflect that. We get caught up in things we shouldn't get caught up. And when we remind ourselves, we go, you know, I, I didn't even think about the gospel today. I'm, I've got all these concerns. I've got all these worries. I've got all these fears. Here Paul says, look, I, I gave you this gospel. You received it. It was a gift to you. And God opened your heart and he granted you faith so you could receive it. And not only did you receive it, notice that they stood in it. And here he switches the tense. He goes to a perfect tense, which means there was a point in time in your history, in your life, you received this. And now you stand and the perfect tense tells us that that's an inter- a during tense. It goes on forever and ever. And so Paul is being kind to them. He's saying, there was a time when God gave you this, a specific time you received the gospel and you became rooted and grounded in the truth and you stood on the fact that Jesus died for your sins. He was buried to prove he was dead and he was resurrected to prove he had victory over your sins and that's the foundation of the gospel. And that is, he says, you've, you've strayed from that. Notice he says, by which you were saved. Again, he switches a tense again. He goes back to a passive, excuse me, a present passive. Meaning, right now, the gospel is gifting you. And you presently and continually hold on to salvation, which is rooted in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're right now. Paul, Paul said earlier, he said, you're being saved. Or you have been saved. He uses all those tents to show that in our salvation, God embraces us and keeps us in salvation from the time of new birth all the way through eternity. Wow, what a statement. What a statement of our great God. But then he says this. Now notice this. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you unless you believe in vain. Now doubtlessly they're unsaved among Corinth church. They sure act like it, don't they? They've taken in a lot of pagan rituals. They've had all kinds of problems. And so here we have probably some unbelievers. When we get to the end, or someday we're going to get to the end of 2 Corinthians. I might come back around to teach that. But you get to the end of 2 Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 5. He says, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. Now, why does he say that? Because doubtlessly there's unsaved people in the church. And that's probably true here today. There's probably people in a crowd this big, a church this big, this many people online watching us, people who have walked some aisle, said some prayer, raised some hand, did something on their own strength, and yet genuinely are not in the faith. And so Paul says to examine this. And that's why he makes this statement. If you continue in it, if you continue in it, that's, that's a great difference between the academic head knowledge and a true worshiper. Now, there's nothing wrong with academic head knowledge. We, we want you to grow. We have discipleship programs. We have Bible studies. We have all this stuff so you learn to love the Lord. But that should produce a true worshiper. That's the goal. And only true worshipers are resurrected for eternity. Do you know that? Only true re- worshipers are resurrected for eternity with Christ. All others are resurrected to judgment. Everybody's resurrected. Everybody's given a physical body. One, for the enjoyment of eternity with our God and Savior. The other, to survive judgment for all time. And we'll see that as we go down through this text. But for the true worshiper, you receive the gospel, right? The gospel that saves you. It causes you to stand in, the, in this truth, in a world of lies, right? You're flooded by a world of lies. What's going to help you get through that? Because you stand in the gospel. Oh, that gives you such strength. You cling to that. You hold to it. It means your faith isn't in vain. You know God saved you. You are convinced without a shadow of doubt because your, your, your work is not in yourself. You believe in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and you have assurance. And so that brings us to the doctrine of perseverance. That's what he's talking about here. It tells us that you can be assured because your faith is in Christ's work, not your own. I, I've said this a million times We don't persevere to be saved. We persevere because we're saved. You see the difference? There's a lot of people out there going, well, I just, I got to go to church. I got to do this. And I got to line up this. And I I can't do that. No, they're trying to persevere, hoping they can get across the finish line. If that's you, brother or sister, that's not salvation. That's works. And I'm not saying this life is easy. I'm not saying that, that things are not difficult here. But let me say this. If you're saved, you're going to run through the tape no matter what road God chooses you to take. 
you will finish. It may be difficult. It may be easier. Some go home to be with the Lord at a young age and don't see all the difficulties that some of us do. God lets some of us go through some very difficult times to bring him glory through those difficult times, to change us and cause us to be like Christ more. But whatever it is, a true believer is going to finish. You may need us to hold your hand. I may need you to hold my hand when I finish. But we're going to finish, aren't we? Because God has done a finished work in our lives. And so for those in the Corinth church and many others, there was a lot of emotional charged relationship with some kind of gospel. But Christ himself told parables. Look, he said, seed falls on road and Satan snatches it away like the birds. Some seeds fall on rock and they spring up quickly, but they fade away with affliction and persecution. There's others that fall in the thorns and they're choked out because of world, worries of the world. And listen to this, deceitful desire for gain. Those things are choked out. But true faith comes to the one who believes the word of God. And God proves that believer to put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the one who will be resurrected to eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ. You're committed to the entire gospel. I'm committed to Jesus' death on the cross. That he died and he died in my place. He became sin for me in a sense. He, he took my sin, stood in my place, substitutionary death. I believe they put his dead body in a grave to show that the wages of sin is death. And I believe the Father gave him life on the third day, and he breathed, and he came out of that grave just like he promised to show that he had beat sin, Satan, and death. That's the gospel. And this is evidence. That's, we, are, we are evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at all of us. Whole room full of people here giving evidence because we believe the gospel. Amen? Second thought. The second evidence of the resurrection is the infallibility of the scriptures. Look at verses 3 and 4. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now Paul returns again to the gospel and particularly to the infallibility in the divine revelation of God's word. He goes, look, he goes, I delivered to you of first importance what I received. He's a deliverer of it. I love this, right? That's Paul's commission. He's commissioned to deliver the word of God. He's commissioned to deliver to every tribe and tongue and people, everyone that God puts in his way. He's not commissioned to deliver his own words. And neither are you. You can't make up your own Bible. <laughs> you can't make up your own interpretation of the Bible. That's why we work hard to get it right. Because we deliver what God has given. And here particularly, this is special revelation. The, the New Testament wasn't written. So God gave Paul this message, this gospel, the word of God, and he's delivered it to him. Notice he says a first importance. Protos is the word there. Great word. It means priority, force. Uh, foremost, first of all, it carries the idea of being chief of all things, right? And, and then he says, you received it. It denotes a reception of something. It's actually used of taking into custody something. We, we took in, when we read God's word or we hear it preached, we take it into the custody of our heart, don't we? And you go, that's for me. Right? It's so easy to think of somebody else when you're hearing a good sermon, right? Or maybe a mediocre one like this one. Um, you go, oh man, I wish so-and-so was here. Yeah, I get that. You're trying, you want people to get saved. But it's for you. God's word is delivered for you, whether you're sitting with your Bible on your lap in your pickup truck at lunch break, or, or you're up early in the morning or late at night, God's word is delivered for you to know the gospel, to hear him speak to you. Paul believed this with all his heart. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Let's go to your right, a book or two. He knows what God was doing in his life. Verse 11, chapter 1. For I would have you know, here he goes again, right? He speaks so definitively. It's just no messing around. I want you to know this. He's a preacher. He, and, and let me go beyond that. He's someone who believes the gospel. If you believe the gospel, you have people in your life that you want to know this, don't you? And I love the passion of Paul, right? For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. Praise God. 
Because those men always fall away, don't they? And they cause all kinds of problems, right? Praise God, it's from God. For, ne- for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Wow, Paul's getting direct revelation here. He can. That's what God was doing. Verse 13. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism. If you haven't, you're going to hear now. How I used to persecute the church beyond measure, wow, strong terms, and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions, not the law. The law of God will actually lead you to the gospel. Because it's a tutor, he's going to say that later on. He, he was extremely strong on the traditions of man. Don't do this. Don't eat that. Don't be with these people. Don't wear that. Don't go that. You know, all that. Now look what he says. But when God. Now I'm a marker of my Bible. I hope you are too. That's circled in my Bible. I'm looking right at it. Isn't that wonderful? You think you've got this religious goal in your life. You're, you're, you're a good person. You're doing all these things that you think are right. I'm holding the traditions. But then God comes along and exposes you are a wretch. You think you're something, but you're not. And notice he says, but when God, who set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, the pagans. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. This is very detailed. But I did not see any other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And then you, you know what happened in Acts chapter 9. I don't have time to go there. He's, he's on the way. He's, he's headed to go destroy homes and break up churches and, and, and put people to death possibly if need be in Acts chapter 9. And the Lord meets him there. Knocks him off his steed. And there exposes himself to Paul and says, why are you persecuting me? What a great statement. You hurt my church. You hurt me. Good reminder, isn't it? Take care of the church. Be careful. Because when you hurt the church, you hurt Christ. He's very clear on that. And there he takes him in and he teaches him through this man who was afraid of him. He says, and I said, this man's done great harm to the way. And he says, oh, no, no, no. Listen, I've saved Paul. And he's going to suffer great for my name's sake. You take care of him. There his sight was gained and he was back and so Paul looks back and what he's doing here in in our passage as you turn back to 1 Corinthians 15 Paul is now reflecting back on the sovereignty of God who knew him from the foundations of the world who knew him in his mother's womb and then sought him out and drew him to himself on that Damascus road there and then the Lord himself educated and trained him personally in the deserts of Arabia what an education now, we can't quite give you that here at, at uh, Christ Theological Seminary and Bible College, but we're going to use his word. We're going to teach you to be a student of the word, and I invite every one of you to take classes because you're going to come away with that, but what an amazing experience he has had. And so the priorities of first importance here is his message. His message is the priority, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ according to the scriptures. Three indispensable truths. Christ died for our sins. He was buried to prove the wages of sin. And his father resurrected him to show without a shadow of doubt he beat all of that. Now, the disciples struggled fully um, to understand this at first. Jesus knows that. He meets a couple of them on the Emmaus Road. And we're going to get through this point and then I'll, I'll, I'll jump onto this next week. Um, and, and what a beautiful story it is. Luke chapter 24, some of the disciples have, the resurrection's already taken place. Jesus has appeared to Peter already. These men are on the, on the mass road. They're traveling, and Jesus shows up among them. And they start saying, well, where have you been? Do you have your head in the sand? Remember they said, you know, it's almost like, I can't believe you don't know this, because Jesus is kind of playing along like, well, what events are happening in Jerusalem? <laughs> well, the potential Messiah came and, and, and they crucified him and, and they put him in a grave and, and then some of our own got there and it was empty, the women and Peter. 
And even they, he even appeared to Peter. And so Jesus says to them, verse 25, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Let me stop right there. To most of the Jews, it was not necessary. They don't need the death of a king. They just want the kingdom. That's what the world wants today. It has not changed. Just let me go to heaven, believe my little sparkly thing, and I'll be good. I'm not, I, again, I, I, you know, I vote a certain way. I'm not like those people or whatever. See, Jesus hits it right on the head. Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer these things? Absolutely it was necessary. We all go to hell if he doesn't. He had to suffer in such ways. And then, oh, could you imagine this seminary class? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explains to them the things concerning himself and all of the scriptures. You want to talk about biblical theology? That was a great class. Oh, my goodness. And you start to see, notice Paul keeps saying, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures in this text, right? Right? And so Jesus here begins to teach the infallibility of the word of God. That's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about the infallibility. He's talking about inerrancy. He's talking about authority. He's talking about sufficiency of scriptures. That's what he's saying. That's what the gospel teaches. And so Jesus comes along and he says, the the Old Testament's all talking about me. Genesis 22, Isaac and Abraham, an altar, (laughs) knife in the air. Ram caught in the thickets with thorns around its horns. Substitutionary death. Off comes Isaac. On comes the male unblemished ram. All through the scriptures. Passage after passage pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he's telling you. Can you imagine when he got to uh, Psalms 22, that is a description of crucifixion a thousand years before it was ever used. Can you imagine when you get to Psalm 16 and he says that God promised that the Messiah's body would not see decay. Can you imagine when he got to Isaiah 53? Man, what a lesson. What a lesson. And every sacrifice and every lamb, all of this pointing to Christ. The writer of Hebrews says he's the greater prophet, the greater priest, the greater kings. A shadow of things to come, better things to come. He had to fulfill the first in order to usher in the second. All pictures of what Jesus was doing. And he gave that example on the Emmaus Road as, listen to this, as the resurrected Savior and King. Standing there with him. Ah, well, there's two evidence. I, I got to get two more next week. We're going to be, I'm going to get to those, and they're awesome, because he starts to appear to people over and over. And then we're going to go down, and he's going to start to take on this silly, pagan view that you're not going to raise from the dead. And he's going to prove it because he raised Christ. Don't want to miss next week. Bring somebody. They're going to hear the gospel, okay? Father, thank you for this time. We want to enter into the Lord's table with a right heart, Lord. Now, we, we know that you died for us. And what a, what a wonderful thing that is just not death. It's resurrection. It's as John said, it's the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was resurrected, glorified. And he was exalted and placed at the right hand of the Father. And every tongue and every uh, mouth will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, whether they agree with him or not. And so, Lord, we are in this passage as well. We will be resurrected. We will be like Christ when we see him. And so, Lord, it's so important for us to realize that, yes, this life is difficult. There will be trials and tribulations, our Lord said. But there's a great end to this. Death does not have a sting. Death cannot permanently kill kill us. God, you, through your son, took care of the second death, and we will reign with him. And we long for that day. And so, Lord, help us remember this as we read our Bibles this week leading up to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Cause us to be consumed with his glory, captured by his person. May this be a great week for us as Christians, followers of Jesus. In your name, amen.
as we think about the Lord's table, I can't think of a better time to do it. I love the Lord's table. It's a great worship. Um, but we're just about ready to put this in your hands. And I, just a few thoughts, because I know we're running a little bit late here. But I want to get this into your hands, and then the team is going to lead us in a song, and we're going to sing with them, and we're going to pray, and we're going to think deeply about this. But what a week to think about the Lord's table. Friday night, we're going to see him at the table with his disciples. And he's going to offer bread, and he's going to hold up this bread, and he's going to say, this is my body. Because he's the bread of life. Picture it all through the Old Testament. Now it's coming to him. I'm the bread of life. You've got to eat me, John 6. <laughs> Many disciples did not follow him any longer, the Bible says. You've got to take me in. You've got to consume me. And you've got to drink my blood. You've got to take that in, that I bodily died for you. And I have the ability to wash away your sins. That's what communion, the Lord's table, is about. This cannot save you. If you're here and you're not a Christian, let it go by. or It it's, we can't do anything for you but condemn you, actually. This is for people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's for us to say, my Lord Jesus bodily dead for me, died for me. And he is my bread of life. I have no new life. I have no eternal life without him. His blood washed away my sins, not only my past, my present, and my future. And I am white, clean, forgiven. And I stand in the presence of our Heavenly Father. That's what this is. So this is for believers. So if you're not, let it go by. And you say, well, Scott, I've been struggling this week. Well, I think you better take this. And I think you better think hard about that as it works towards it. Because if you're going to try to get yourself cleaned up enough to take this, you're never going to take it. Now is the time to say, God, I did not listen to you this week. I did not think of the power of the bread of life and the blood of Christ this week. And I lived a way that is displeasing to you. Will you forgive me? Because I know you have. And I take this, Lord, in remembrance that you forgave my sins. And, and let this encourage you this week to say, I don't want to fall into those same sins any longer. I want to be the husband, the wife, the, uh, the young person, the single. I want to be the person that God has saved and walk with you. Will you think about those things as we get into your hands and as the team listens, uh, uh, teach, uh, sings to us? Will you, will you do that for me? I'm going to do it. Will you do it with me? Okay, let's go. of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell you it goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell the guilty pen Bowed down with care, God gave His Son to win His erring child. He reconciled and pardoned from His sin. Could be with Him. Were every star on earth a queen and every man a scribe by train to write the love of God above would dream the ocean. from sky to sky Saints and angels. 
back up here in your hand is something that represents the love of God doesn't it it isn't I mean we have to understand it is just a, a wafer <laughs> not a very good one um, and it's some grape juice but it represents the love of God doesn't it God would love us so much he would give his only begotten son right his one and only, the unique one, the one that shares his glory and nature, he gave his sameness, didn't he? He gave it to us. And so when we think about that, and we think about that Jesus came, walked on this earth, took our punishment, became sin for us, that we might gain his righteousness to his finished work, that's love. And in your hand is a demonstration of that. So will you quietly thank the Lord for his love while I serve these men? back that first layer and get that wafer out. I'm going to be done with these things soon. He's the bread of life who gives us new life. Open the juice part two. He is. He has pure blood. <laughs> it didn't have to be offered time and time again. Once and for all, he offered his blood. And he brought it into the most holy, holy before God himself in a tabernacle not made by hands of men, but to the throne of God. That's love. Father in heaven, we thank you that you devised a perfect plan before the foundations of the world ever existed. You knew your created image bearers would, would turn away from you. And you devised a plan to rescue us. But it was a costly one. It was the death, burial, and resurrection of your son. Nothing else would work. Nothing else would get man back to you and so lord we are here to thank you for your clear demonstration of love the sufficiency of the lord jesus christ death burial and resurrection and we take it in the name of christ and we love you for your plan and how you executed it we give you all the praise all the glory in jesus name amen take the bread with me please Remember the blood of Jesus Christ. Take that with me. Will you stand with me for a closing prayer? Lord, we thank you that you delivered this truth to us. The truth that we're sinners, we have no way to get to you, but you made a plan. 
and you executed it perfectly. We thank you that that's been delivered to us of first importance, that Jesus Christ died, was buried and, buried and resurrected. We thank you for that, Lord. We, we are grateful. We worship you. We remember you today as we've done collectively. And now, Lord, I ask that you would help us remember you as we go out those doors. We remember you in our marriages. We remember you in our parenting. We remember you on our jobs. We remember you in our neighborhoods. And we'll certainly remember you here in this church. We ask that you do this in our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.